Hey there, everybody, and welcome back to the Growing Band Director Podcast. My name is Kyle Smith, and joining me is my friend and colleague, Jeff Smith. Our mission is to share practical advice and explore topics that will help every band director, no matter your experience level, as well as music education students who are working to join us in the coming years. Together, we will discuss many aspects of a well-rounded band program, but most importantly, we will discuss concepts that help us all improve our own programs each and every day. Always remember the famous quote by Ray Kroc, when you're green, you're growing, and when you're right, you rot. Let's get started. All right, everybody, thank you again for joining the the Growing Band Director podcast. I'm extremely honored to have Craig Skeffington on here. Craig, how's life treating you? Very well, thank you. Um, A big thank you goes to Craig from me. Um, You know, what was it, 1990? 94. Four. So that's 28 years you've been my mentor. Mm, wow. So like, if I'm terrible, it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> I accept full responsibility. Yeah. And how many hundreds of people have you mentored oh, dear along Lord. the way? Uh, Lots. Too many to count. And yep. I'm happy to do it. Um, so today we're going to be talking about lots of things jazz band related, right? So we might get into stuff that's not jazz band related, but that's sort of our focus. And... Um, so let me introduce you from my point of view. So I was a sophomore in high school, and you came, and all I remembered was we got good real fast. Uh, I remember that too, and I remember <laughs> a lot of really good players. Yep. Um, so then from there, and I told the story on a podcast, I don't know if it's aired yet, about how I, oh, the one last week about getting to college, about it was February of my senior year, and I was like, yeah, we go to UNH for the Clark Terry Jazz Festival. I think I want to apply there. I don't know if you remember this. I and do then remember. You drove me down. Yeah. To my so thank you yep. for driving me down. I'm not sure I said thank you at the and time. And I, yeah, it's fine. I did that with Maria too. Do you remember yep. that? Yep. They convinced her to go to Boston College, and then she realized they didn't have a music program. Yep. So anyway, I called up Umaine Orno and spoke to Chip Farnham, yep. and then took her up the next day and got her an uh, audition. So yeah. Well, I, I was very lucky that it worked out because I didn't have a backup plan. <laughs> so. Thank you for your in there, and everything for me has worked out splendidly since then. You're so, welcome. I appreciate it. Um, I never remember like looking at you and saying, I want to be a band director because of you, but there's a good chance that was that. Well, um, if that's true, then I'm honored. I remember I've had the same. Uh, David Sosier was, for me, um, Don Stratton, mm-hmm. um, who you know a little bit, mm-hmm. Terry White. Um, Stan Buchanan. So there's there's been a bunch of older teachers that I had when I was younger coming up thinking, I want to do that. So, so, so let's talk about your story a little bit. Um, boy, this is like, you know, where do you start? Right. Um, I'm originally a saxophone player. Uh, I started on saxophone in the elementary program in Old Town and uh, was really terrible. I was, I was just, <laughs> just really bad and, uh, I, and, and quit. Uh, luckily, David Sosier came. He was. Uh, he came back to town. He was about a block away, and he saw me riding a bike one day. And he said, "Here are the Skeffington kid," and uh, he says, "You're going to play in band ne- next year." I said, "No, I'm not." So he must have talked to my m- mom and dad because th- I was back in band. I, I couldn't even quit. You know, so I could. I, I couldn't do anything well. Uh, <laughs> and so later that year, he asked, "I need you to play in jazz band." I said, "You have to be kidding me." And uh, there was something about jazz band. We p- played a song called Sunday Drive by Jay Chataway. And you probably recognize the name Jay Chataway. Okay. It was kind of a mindless grade two middle school rock band piece. Um, but I liked it. And I was, I was almost embarrassed to admit that I liked, you know, music. And I would take, <laughs> that was like the, the, the breaking point where they didn't have um, eight tracks anymore. They had cassette tapes. So I took the cassette tape home and I practiced my saxophone to Sunday Drive. And it drove my parents crazy. But, you know, I, I was whatever. Mm-hmm. So that was it. You know, and I, that was like the hook. And I was, I was you a musician. In. Yeah. And all through, and I know you, you did it too because you were a tennis player in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, it didn't matter. I left hockey. Um, there was no way I was good. You, you can't play in band. We've got hockey. I mean, I was like, I'll go to the half halfway point in the game. I'm leaving. I'm going to go play with the band. Yeah. And uh, I was obstinate about I was going to do the things I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. So Stub- stubborn would be a good word. Yeah. Okay. Obstinate <laughs> is a 50 cent college, you know, word. But yeah, same thing. 
So, so then where was the switch to trumpet? Uh, my sophomore year, uh, uh, seven through nine was middle school. Ten through twelve was high school. I got to the high school, and this they was were in Old Town. Old Town. They were loaded. They had tons of upperclassmen um, who were better saxophone players, but we only had three trumpets. I said, "Well, I could see the you know the writing on the wall." So I picked up a trumpet, and as luck would have it, and I had no idea what I was doing. I, I figured out a way to play high notes before I even knew that like the full fingering pattern, mm-hmm. and uh, that's kind of what happened, you know. And uh, the technique eventually caught up, and uh, that was it, mm-hmm. you know. And I just I. From tenth grade on, what are you in tenth grade? Fifteen. Yeah. So that's and that was I didn't play saxophone ever again, and you know maybe I should have stuck with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then after high school, where'd you go? I went to UMaine and uh, UMaine Orono, and I was lucky to have Don as a teacher and a mentor. Um, I was there for three, three, three and a half years, and was not doing well. Um, mm-hmm. In fact, at one point. Um, I switched my embouchure. I think I've told you that story before. Mm. I couldn't play. I went from playing high notes to beat the band to not being able to play out of the staff. Mm. And it's, you know, that's frustrating. Mm -hmm. And I remember, I said, I I can't do this anymore. So I closed the trumpet case, threw it in the car, walked across the mall to the School of Business, enrolled in the School of Business, and that's what I did. And I was three classes away from getting a business degree when I realized, what are you doing? I said, I don't want to do this either. we lived near the Army Guard uh, base in mm-hmm. Bangor. So I had a bunch of friends who had been in active duty. So anyway, I ended up leaving and going to, uh, to boot camp and uh, was at Fort Dix. And when I came back from Fort Dix, I was in the Army Guard band. Yep. And uh, it was that time I, I got sort of more focused about playing. And when I got back to school, I was, you know, ready. Yep. You know? And so everyone needs a kick at a butt once in a while. And so mine was you know, the service. Mm-hmm. So when I came back, I was ready to go. And it wasn't long after I came back that I, I started at South Portland. Right. So how did that come up where you actually found a job that you were, and you applied for it and got it? And Well, it's just funny that we were just having a conversation about local jobs and band yeah. directors. Um, I had played a gig with John Furman mm-hmm. that summer. And uh, it was when I had chops. And John still tells me about it when we see just it's like the end of the tune. It was like some high note and I just took a breath and I played a double C and right. I hung over and it was like, whoa. And Furman looked at me with that funny, you know, <laughs> and uh, when I put in my application packet, he remembered who I was. Yeah. And so I think my pile went from here to here because he, he just wanted <laughs> to see what I would yeah. look like in, a, in the interview. And uh, so that was it. And at that time, you know, South Portland, Tom Scavoni, who you had as a, a yep. teacher and Norm yep. Richardson, they were, they were great music teachers and uh, they hired some kid, you know, me who never had a high school band directing job. So mm-hmm. anyway, it was people ask cause they assume there must be some grandiose thing and there, you know, yeah, there just, just wasn't. Yeah. Sort of meant to be. I, I worked hard for it and right. uh, I learned a lot of lessons along the way, but that was the, that was the beginning. Well, you've always struck me as somebody who like, whether or not you know the answer, you whatever, you're going to find the answer. Yep. Right. Yeah. And whatever you have to do to get to there, it may take you a bunch of tries along the way, but you're going to, you're not going to give up until you get there. Yeah. And I think that all the, the people that we know in our circle are probably that same way. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if anyone says, I know that answer right off, I mean, they're, they're probably BSing you, right? Mm-hmm. But if you, the people that are honest, like, I, I'm not really sure about that, but I'll, I'll get back to you, yep. you know, so that's literally been my whole career. And, and what about writing? Tell us about how you got started arranging and writing. Well, thank you. Um, So I was interested, Don Stratton was a writer, and uh, the summer that I did drum corps, um, I think I was 20, and uh, Terry White was a writer, and I was struck by that. I'm like, so Terry White and Don Stratton were like huge influences, and Mm -hmm. I thought, boy, this writing thing is cool. Terry some, said something to me, uh, which I still remember 35 years later. He, he probably said, doesn't, though. Uh, I, you know, I, if I think if I said it to him, he'd remember. Okay. He's like, you know, the great thing about being a writer is you don't have to be a player. You can show up and play fifth trumpet. You just bring a bunch of charts, and, you know, you're making a contribution mm-hmm. to the band. I thought, well, that's an interesting concept. And uh, the first things I wrote were, were just patently awful. You know, everything was in unison. I had no idea about harmony. When I was in the service, um, the commander said Skeffington, because I was the young guy in the section, said, we're missing a second trumpet part. Figure it out. 
So I had to, you know, collect all these parts and study everyone else that did drink it at the bar. And I'm like trying to, okay, the first trumpet <laughs> part's an F and the bottom note's a G sharp. That one must be a D, you know, and I've just by sort of like reverse engineering, yeah. I kind of figured out like line writing and how things went together. And then uh, as far as the, the big band thing, um, when I got back, I started to take um, real charts, like Rob McConnell charts, mm-hmm. and I would untranspose the saxophone parts to see what they were doing mm-hmm. when there was a line. I'm like, oh, that's the same. So chord. you'd have to input them into computer. I'd sit by hand. Oh, this okay. is before computer. Yeah. And uh, I would take like four bars and turn it from transpose back into concert, mm-hmm. so I could study the passing tones and whatnot. I'm like, oh, I see what they're doing, and uh, that was kind of it. So, so that was your manual. You just took great it. charts yeah. and just learned from them. Yeah. And. Uh, uh, the, uh, pr- that was the practical application of it. And I was lucky um, very soon when I, I was back on the scene, I got on the Seacoast band and uh, Terry White's band. Yep. So I had a band to write with or write for, you know, at the beginning. And we had really great players. You know, Ralph Norris was around, Rusty Quinn. So, you know. And you could you could almost write anything? Yeah. Not anything, but you're yeah. writing for prose. Yeah. Yeah. And I like in a very specific style, like our local players, it's, there's like great swing tradition mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, tunes, people know tunes in different keys. Mm-hmm. So yeah, anything I wanted to write, I, I could write. And uh, yeah, that was the, how I sort of fell into that. So I'm going to scoot ahead to something we were going to talk about because it seems to work well with what we're talking about now. Um, if anybody was in that shoe, their shoe, your shoes right now and they kind of wanted to start writing, right? Or arranging mm. or both or whatever. Sure. Um, they could always do what you did, right? You just take charts and figure it out and yep. copy that stuff. But are there other resources now that you would... Yeah, here's the thing. To be a writer, you have to write. And I, that sounds like, well, what do you mean? Mm-hmm. Um, people get bogged down in Finale or Sibelius where the project takes three months and they haven't heard note one of live music. Write eight bars and get that played. And if that means, if you're a band director and you're kind of, yeah, I want to write a solely for my kids. Well, write the solely and you know in unison and have it played back because mm-hmm. there's a lot of information just on like a unison line that you can figure out. Um, so my biggest, not complaint, my biggest criticism of people that say I'm going to write is that they never actually get their stuff played. Mm-hmm. You know, so I know that's a pain in the butt. Like right now, you know, we're working on marching band things, or if I have a jazz band commission, hey, can you just get us what you've got? Well, that means you've got to stop and extract all the parts, mm-hmm. which is a pain in the butt. But, you know, if it's for you, if you're doing it for yourself, you know, why wouldn't you do that? If the, if the coolest thing, as you know, is to hear your music play live. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just the computer never misses anything, but it has no heart, no soul. You know, when you finally hear people play your music, it's, it's unbelievable. Sometimes it's better. Sometimes it's worse. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it, that's, yes. And if you make a mistake because it's... Uh, well, something you thought was going to be useful, like trombone, um, B flat to B natural, you know, and the computer mm-hmm. goes, do, 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 and you know, you, you people are missing the visual here from one to seven. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think we can picture. The yeah, one yeah, to yeah, seven. yeah. The people that are, <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, yeah, the computer never misses that. And then when you write it, you're like, oh, geez, I forgot about that. Or, you know, like tenor comes in on a low C sharp, you know, Honk. pianissimo, <laughs> right? That's no, that's not going to work. I mean, so yeah, just the feedback that you get from people playing your music immediately. Um, and you can only do that if you just, you know, don't. And w- what if somebody is a writer or a band director and they didn't really study any of the arranging stuff beyond, you know, typical classical harmony. Are there method books, textbooks, there, courses? There, I, YouTube is the answer for everything. Yeah. But there's a, an, a writer, arranger, composer on uh, YouTube called Elliot Deutsch. And Elliot Deutsch, um, he's sort of a comedian. He's like, he laughs at his own jokes, but his stuff is, uh, uh, his stuff is great. And he talks about harmonizing, you know, writing for four trumpets. Um, writing for the trumpets and trombones is like a separate podcast. Um, and you don't need a, a ton of advanced knowledge. Yeah. You know, you just have to be interested in the genre, you know. And so it's very entertaining and it's, he doesn't speak above you or down to you. Mm-hmm. So I, I would recommend that. Highly. Awesome. Well, why don't we talk about some some existing jazz charts, um, charts or arrangers that are your go tos. Yep. Um, so I will say you've had the experience of teaching for a long time, teacher uh, students high school mainly, right? Almost exclusively, yeah. Um, but sometimes you have a second band at the high school, which really of a middle school level because mm-hmm. they're on new instruments of or course. they're just newer or yep. whatever. So. 
the p- the kids are maybe high school, but you're used to teaching everything from. Yep. I don't know the position of this. Yep. I, I've never touched the bass. You're going to play in my top jazz sure. band. Yep. Um, up to, well, three quarters of the band plays in all state and they can really play. Yeah. And so you've kind of dealt with all of it. Yeah. Um, so let's talk arrangers or specific charts. Like what, what speaks to you? Well, we probably subscribe to the same like limited circle or, or like the, the top mm-hmm. upper echelon. Mike Camuff. Yep. Um, I, I know you mentioned writers and charts, and so sometimes at my advanced age, it's hard to remember like which ones they did. Yep. But Mike did um, Stomping at the Savoy mm-hmm. this year, and Mike has a great sensibility of like writing things on old standards, but with a new either harmonic or modern twist somehow. Yeah. Come off as K-M- K-A-M-U-F. Yep. Some people say Kamuf, some the Kamuf. I think it's Kamuf. Are most of them the Green series from Alfred? Uh, the gra- supposedly Grade Two. Yep. Um, but he's almost exclusively two or three. He's in there, and uh, you know he's successful because they're limited in their house to how many new charts will come out every mm-hmm. year, and they gave him like two or three every year. But the the thing is, is they sell and they're great. There's they're, three of his charts I've done that I remember: Little Sunflower, yes, a Pretty Hubbard yep, tune. Yeah. Which, by um, the way, is hard to make interesting because it's such a there's not a lot going on harmonically, and that's a that's a brilliant chart on that. But it's great to choose for kids because if you don't have many improvisers mm-hmm. and you only need really one chord, you can hide it, but it really should be two chords. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then two cannonball tunes, sticks, which is still one of my favorite tunes yep. ever. Yeah. And sack of woe, mm-hmm. which again, great name. Yeah. He did a Freddie Hubbard chart on red clay. Yep. Um, so the, yeah, that stuff is worth its weight in gold. Another one who I know you know, and these guys are both friends of mine. So I've, that's one of the cool things about being a writer and just kind of being out there for years. You should let them know you mentioned him on the podcast. I, I will, as a matter of fact. <laughs> Mark Taylor. Mm-hmm. Mark Taylor is... Uh, a, D- don't you say he's never written a bad, j- a bad jazz band? Chart? It's instant jazz band, just add water. Um, Girl Talk. Um, trying to think. What did we just... Oh, the I ne- have one written down. The, Go ahead. Ne- the Nearness of You. Um, we did a Mark Taylor chart this year. Um, the Elton John tune. Yeah. Um, Goodbye. Goodbye, Yellow Brick Road. Mm-hmm. Um, which, when I first saw it, I was like, really? Really? And but then, then you I, listened to it. And I you listened it. to it, and then I, I texted him. I said, uh, Facebook Messenger. Um, it was parent teacher conference night. I said, I took like two minutes, said, man, I just listened to your chart. It makes the song better. Thank you. This is genius. <laughs> I'm buying it right now. Five minutes later, he calls me. I'm in the middle of a parent teacher conference and I'm like, I'm looking at, I forget who the teacher, the parent was. I'm like, you're gonna have to wait. This is Mark Taylor. I'm sorry. <laughs> so yeah. Um, and he's, he's been relevant in the educational market for 40 years uh, and he's got hundreds of charts. Um, a couple of charts that come to mind for me was there will never be another you. Yes. A great That's one. a great chart. Yeah. yeah. Cause the, the band is almost, f- doesn't that feature brushes? It does. Drummer. And yeah, it's like yeah. band unison rhythms for he the did whole brush head. taps. Yep. Um, which is another sort of drummer feature thing. Um, I have down a uh, Creole love call, mm-hmm. which to me is money. I don't know if you've done that chart or know it, but I, I have the chart and I, that's like another in terms of charts. Uh, and I know cause I've, I've seen your programs for years, the Hal Leonard young jazz ensemble, the white, classes, cover. The yep. white cover. Those are brilliant because yep. they're standards and they're in the original key, which is great. Yep. And uh, uh, he, he does all those. I like that chart because it's, you're playing Ellington, mm-hmm. right? As a ballad, which is hard to find, especially for your young bands, the, right. the ballad is the hardest one to find. Yeah. So it's kind of like second line, kind of not, right? It's that New Orleans dirge. You're checking a lot of boxes. You're checking off like the um, the old style, you know, exposing mm-hmm. the kids. You're doing the ballad thing. Yeah. You, all you need is a trumpet and a trombone player, really. Yeah. 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 And a bunch of cardboard cutouts. <laughs> yeah. Um, so who else? The, uh, obviously. Michael um, Sweeney. My, so Sweeney. I, I, I'm not so knocked out only because I'm not sure I know that many mm-hmm. um, young jazz band charts he's done. I mean, he's, he's, I love his concert band stuff. I'll throw three out real quick because they're on my mind. All Blues, which again is yep. a, a middle tune, mm-hmm. which I think is great. Um, and the other two, one is on Caravan and one is on Afro Blue. And they're like, they're all in this grade two, two and a half, and they're all killer. Yep. Um, I knew it, it, it just hasn't fallen into my kind of circle of what I do. Um, Chris Berg, mm-hmm. I was thinking about this. We did record a May, and Chris is known for the the funk series, all those chicken charts. Um, and, you know, and hey, full, I, dis- full disclosure, he's a friend. Yeah, well, both of ours, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but some of those charts are, are, are just absolutely killing. Um, his chart, Feather Report, yeah. is one of my favorite 
pieces of music, let mm. alone high school big band. Um, I could listen to that on YouTube or Spotify. Just if people just go on J W Pepper and put in Chris Berg K R I S B E R G, yep. and look up the titles, you'll just laugh. Yeah. Because there's so many chicken references. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And every year we had like we've hung out before and tried to think of new like hanging things. with my peeps. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, just yeah. Um, so those are great. And of course, here's the maybe not the last one, but the one that really stands out: um, Terry White. Yes. Um, Terry's charts um, for young band are just magnificent. And uh, and if people search up his stuff online, they'll find lots of it. Yeah. But if they also reach out to him, he's got. I mean, how many hundreds of charters? He's well, and, and so the funny thing is, it kind of like me. I, I got published in two thousand five, like for the first time by a big publisher. Um, Terry's been a writer; he was a mentor of mine, and that was twenty years before that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, they think they discovered Terry White, but Terry's been writing for for ages, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, and he's got stuff in in all the genres now. He writes marching band, he writes wind ensemble, he writes young concert band. He's got tons of grade two and grade actually grade one two and three jazz mm -hmm. band and published by you know tons of people yep so yeah minor chant mm -hmm. he's got a, um misty misty there's a lot of like uh lou donaldson yeah post, oh, what's that post foot, foot uh foot patent foot, time. Foot, foot pat time which i've done the post bebop hard bop era uh -huh. um that kind of sensibility uh really funky tunes but mamacita yeah 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 he did that was the coltrane tune uh Mr. PC mm -hmm. and like stuff at the grade one level yeah. that that gets played. I mean, he's had a lot of pieces played. At My the, biggest uh, pet peeve for grade one is the trombone parts. Like they won't write trumpet above C, but they'll write trombone to high D or yeah, that's, you know what I mean. And that's funny. Yeah, uh, um, I just had a chart uh, that, that was taken shameless plug by Kendor yeah. called Run, and uh, he said I need you to redo the trumpet part. It can't go above an A on the staff. And so I said, well, I'll figure that out. It's a little hard because it's the melody, but whatever. <laughs> um, then I looked and I'm like, well, my second trumpet parts were G on top of the staff. And the first trombone part went to F sharp, you know, which is like the yeah. hardest note on the trombone. Right. And I'm like, so I, it, it made me think, okay, even though everyone's guideline is the first trumpet part, it's the brass section, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you have to, that's a key in, in picking quality music that will fit your kids is like every part is sort of like in that right, right. register for them. So know what your kids can do and then check out all the parts before yes. you actually hand it to him, yeah. hand it to them. And Dale Perkins told me this one time, and I'm sure he's told you this as well. He has a band director who come who used to come up and he would look at the parts instead of the score because he wanted to see what the kids were going to see on the parts. Mm -hmm. And you see the piece differently rather than reading the score. Totally. Yep. When he was choosing the piece. Yep. I have a couple of pieces I wrote down that I would like to share as well. Fat Cat by Doug Beach. I mean, to me, that's like, it's so good. Yep. Um, Another uh, friend. Yep. We've had him up to me. Come fly with me or anything Rick, Rick Stitzel's done. Rick Stitzel's I young agree. stuff yep. is so good. Um, the Jazz for Young People series. Yeah. Is that Alfred? Jazz for Young People. Winton's on the cover. Like second line that is, is in that. Yeah. Twinkle that Twinkle is. Little Star is yep. one of yep. those charts. Do you remember um, Rick Stitzel from your 1994? Yeah, we did. Um, without, yep, a, without, without a, a song. song. That was yep. not a baby chart. No, it was not. <laughs> His his young people charts right now are so good. And then the last one I was going to mention was Paul Baker. Oh God, yeah, yeah. Front row seats. And Paul is uh, he's got his own Baker's Jazz and more, mm -hmm. um, but he's also writing for Alfred, and uh, he just did one on I think Point Siana, hmm. which is a beautiful boss. It's very interesting harmonically, and I I didn't think it could be presented like any other way than Point Siana. And I listened to his chart. I said, man, that's just genius. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's. He yeah. also seems to have the knack for writing original tunes that sound like yes. standard tunes. Yeah, yep. I agree. Like um, I think Terry said one time, this sounds like a Basie chart. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, to, case in point, you had Terry do the Honors Festival mm -hmm. last spring, and that piece that they opened with was a Baker chart, and it was, it was literally Basie. I mean, it mm -hmm. sounded like this is right out of Basie's folder. Was that 88 Basie Street? No, no that's, that's that? a Nestico chart. Um, but it was whatever he opened with that yeah. it was like, but it was in that style. Did you know that Baker was on um, the Tom Kubis CD? Um, he was like in a, a league of players. Bergeron was on well, the, played lead on it. He mentioned it on Facebook one day, and I'm like, oh, my God, he was on that CD. Um, Purple Porpoise Highway was one of the charts on there. It was the hmm. takeoff on Green Dolphin Street. Oh. And the players were just like every A-list Hollywood player. And Paul Baker was on that. Man, he was a heavy player. That's that's awesome. And now he's got a bunch of charts that are hard, but also a bunch that are, yeah. that are easier. Yeah, he gets it. 
Um, Don Zentz, I'll do a shout out to Don Zentz. We both know oh, Don. He's yeah. got he's got a list. If you look up Don's, his last name is Z E N T Z. A list of how many pages is that? Of uh, is that three or charts? four in it's, small print? Yeah. Yeah. So if people want to check out charts, those are great. Now I want to talk to you a little bit because you tend to do more originals than I do, and then I tend to do more standards than you do. So like, what do you think about, or what what do you think people should think about when they're thinking about? Maybe standard, how many standard tunes are doing versus how many original tunes or what's your thought process by, on that? By original, you mean like an original that Terry White wrote or yeah, like, like a, a new any, tune versus an arrangement yep. of a standard tune. Boy, this is, I, I, I hate to give you a very non-scientific answer, but if I like it, yep. I mean, honest to God, yep. if I think I can make the kids sound good, I think the kids will enjoy it, then I'm going to tackle it. Yep. Um, a failing for me, and you're better at it than I am, um, is tackling the older repertoire. You reference Creole Love Call. Yeah. Um, that stuff doesn't speak to me. Mm -hmm. I love history, and I love the uh, um, the video series, the uh, um, Ken yeah. Burns yeah. jazz series. Um, and I've sort of since become a fan of Louis sort of reverse engineering. I like I dig it now, and I didn't I didn't understand it when I was mm -hmm. younger, but. I'm more I'm more interested in the art of the big band as it's like you know gone gone on from like the right. 60s and 70s to now. So, and I don't think there's a right or wrong. It's just no. in in my viewpoint, if I can when we're say say we're working on Misty arranged by Terry White, mm -hmm. we can then go back and listen to the whole lineage of Misty. Yep. Right, and they're learning more about it from there. Yep. I so think I think I tend to do too many of them. I think that's absolutely a great way to do it. I think. This used to be the model ages ago. I'm not sure how many bands do this now. You're only going to do three tunes. You got to pick your three festival tunes, and that you know yeah. that's that's not a great way to do it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're pigeonholed because we've got march and band, and, and spring is off, yeah. so you have to kind of hit your programming right. But you know, I think you can make a lesson program, and a, a, a sense like, okay, we're going to do. Um, we did Yellow Brick Road. And uh, so there were a couple of times where I found some other pop tunes that writers had done for either Buddy Rich or yep. Woody Herman. I said, now check this out. Big band was dying in the 60s. And so writers turned to pop. And this is sort of like where the sensibility came, you know. So I think you can do you can connect things mm -hmm. um, over the course of time for kids because kids don't know anything that, that wasn't. But most yesterday. importantly, you took whatever they were working on and put it in context of a bigger picture. Totally. For them yeah, to understand yeah. that. And a timeline, you know, yep. like this influenced this, which influenced that. You know, it's like the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon. Or, there, there's one more writer I wanted to mention, and I don't have specific charts. There's one, I can't remember what it's called, but it's wicked hard. Um, I have your name down, uh, these names. I have not m mentioned Mike Sakash. I really like Mike's writing. That's, he doesn't have anything published, does he? He doesn't. Yeah. And Mike is literally one of those guys who's like a jack of all trades, master of all trades. Yeah. You know, and that's that's hard to say about a lot of people. Um, Mike's a brilliant writer, but Mike's like the one armed, you know, paper hanger up there right. and uh, at his high school in Freiburg. Yeah. And uh, he's, you know, he's doing vocal stuff. He's doing combo stuff. He's doing band stuff. And uh, he just he and I like, for instance, there's a, several years where I just didn't have a whole lot of output. But when I stopped and thought about it, it just, I, I wrote the marching band show. Um, I wrote yeah. seven rewrites for the jazz band. I did all sorts of writing, but it was like just to keep my head above water with the high school program. And I think that's a lot of what Mike does now that, yeah, we've got some of his charts in uh, in the PJO book, what was all or nothing at all, mm -hmm. um, which is just killing. Is there an original chart? Is it called chant chant? I love that. Chart. It's a great chart. It's hard. Yeah, it I is I remember hard. hearing it once and being like, oh, I wonder if we could. No. Okay. Yeah. So we, <laughs> I think the CD, the Generation CD, we did two of his charts. Yeah, we let's did, plug that. Where can they find that and what is it? Um, it's on Spotify and CD Baby. Yeah. And uh, it's the Portland Jazz Orchestra doing um, our own arrangements, almost all standards. I think, in fact, I maybe except for Chant. And we featured all the local, a lot of the local players that were like iconic. So mm -hmm. Tony Baffa, um, Gary Wright. Rick Gordon, um, Terry White is a writer, John Foss, our lead trumpet player, Ralph Norris. So all these icons that were mentors, you know, over the years. And it, it, it came out great. What a way to pay homage to them. Oh, it was it was a very cool production. We recorded it at South Portland High School over um, two sessions. So it's called Generations. Generations, yeah. So CD Baby and iTunes, you can find it. I found some of your stuff on, on SoundCloud. Mm-hmm. Um, is that organized in any way or is it kind of random? Are you on there and you have a lot of your stuff on I there? Have, I have some things that have been recorded. So Seacoast, I guess Seacoast hasn't recorded yet, but 
PGO's recorded two. Um, Nor'easter was the first one. Again, uh, mm-hmm. Spotify, CD Baby, and whatever, iTunes. Um, so stuff from Nor'easter and Generations are on there. Um, yeah, and so a lot of times, like my SoundCloud account, um, judges recordings from festivals. Yeah. I'll throw that up there. So it's like kind of a hodgepodge of stuff that's, yeah. you know, my life as a band director mixed with a, a writer. Um, okay, let's jump into rehearsing the jazz band because you've had groups over how many decades and they're all just killer, right? Oh, thank you. And like, well, and you hear them and you're like, oh, they must have amazing players every year. But then you realize, no, you just find a way to get whoever's there to their... Sure. What's There's a quote, a John Wooden quote, the job of the leader is to help every member realize their potential or, yeah. or whatever that yeah. is. Um, so talking about like, how do we get bands so tight? Can you, again, we're going to take a full semester course and put it into a couple minutes here, but yeah. let's talk uh, rhythm section. What are some sort of like philosophies of, say you have to tighten a band and you're going to go, okay, I'm going to work on the rhythm section first. And- well, if I think if I were working with somebody who was like wanted to be a good jazz band director, you're just fresh out of college, yep. had band chops, but had never played in a jazz band, I might play in some. You know, like band A, band B. Band A is kind of struggling, inexperienced. Band B is swinging out the door, and said, "What's the difference?" And the, well, the drummer. Okay, so I mean, you and I know uh, that the three most important things are the drummer, the bass player, and the lead trumpet. Yeah. You can make any band work if you've got that happening. Yeah. And so, I I think the first thing is drums. So you listen to the drums and the idea of filling. You know, one, two, cha, pa, dun. Okay, well, that's you just caught the figure. You know, you played exactly what the horns did. But if you went, then you played the fill. You, you, mm-hmm. you did two things. You filled it and you caught the figure. Um, you can listen to pop tunes. I turn on the radio right now. It's a rock groove, but listen to the drummer. He filled and then he caught the figure. And so I think if you can get drummers to buy into the idea of like, um, da, 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 like the, the cliche sort mm-hmm. of drum fills, um, and then make that swing. Mm-hmm. I think that's that's huge. And the other thing is is that uh, most band directors ignore the rhythm section. Correct. They kind of do something over there, and I'm just not going to make eye contact with those people, and hopefully it'll just all work out. When it's really reverse, if yeah. they're happening. Yeah, the rest of the band comes along. Yep. So for me, it's always the drummer, and I always try to be really nice to the drummer because at the same time, it's like most, I would say 80% of my rehearsal is like, I need you to do this. Now kick this here, go to, you know, chop wood on two and four. And the drummer's like, and I've had young man I had this past year was just great. Mm -hmm. And uh, studies with Sean and uh, it's going to be killing. So I've been very, very lucky over the years. Chris Morrow. um, I've had really, really good players. So if you're taking a swing pattern, a couple of things I've done is, first of all, the hi-hat. This is a Brad Johomsky thing, right? The hi-hat should be like as loud as you can all mm-hmm. the time, like playing to the other side of the band. And then the ride cymbal's got to line up with the bass player. But I think the whole thing from the early bassy band was the ride cymbal's obviously a short sound, right? But it's got to line up perfectly with the legato right. sound of the bass. And if it's almost like I've actually had kids shake hands with their right hands because mm-hmm. it's the right hand on both of them and then have them play the quarter notes and get that locked yeah. in like now that where group. do you put your bass player in relation to your drummer i typically put them between neck next to the trumpet too between the trumpets and the bass okay uh, and trumpets you, and the drummer and you put the bass like uh, like off the hi-hat and behind the drummer yep okay typically. which is so stratton taught us he wanted the bass player to be able to see the hi-hat mm-hmm. on two and four and he wanted like and like really pulling hard on two and four, matching the timing of the mm-hmm. hi-hat. And uh, it's funny, so modern ones now have the bass player off the ride cymbal, right. um, like between the piano. And mm-hmm. then I'm like, anyway, so I have a couple of strange things that I do that are sort of handoff. You well, know. it's funny because if they're good enough, it doesn't really you matter. You could put them in the you next know. room over. It's, yeah, of course. <laughs> um, okay. And then basically if the drums and the bass are happening, piano player shouldn't play too much guitar player is usually doing Freddie Green yeah at least on that yeah. stylistically style. obviously um you know I've gone and I know that you have done this before like the Midwest Clinic yeah and uh Jen which is Jazz Education Network um I've attended some really great conferences where they talk about comping you know just like the shell voicing thing like um three seven nine in the yep. guitar part and then only downstrokes yeah you know rock is doing chung 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 like downstroke down up down up which, is, yep. which sounds terrible when you actually put it in context um but until someone explained that to me i'm like well duh that makes perfect sense mm-hmm. um p 
piano players, you know, uh, rhythmically, a lot of like my piano parts, if I don't want to be like completely notated, I'll give them a, a good voicing at C13 and I'll write comp ad lib. But if you don't explain that to a kid, they're going to go C13 for a whole note, F13 for a whole note, E flat 13 for a whole note, and it's the least interesting part ever. Right. So you have to sing voodoo da, va, voo da, you know, you have to, because they're just, they don't listen to that. Mm -hmm. So rhythmic awareness, like in cliche, you know, phrases. And when in doubt, your piano player is probably playing too much rather than not enough, yeah, I found. I, like I, they, if they have the chord, they kind of over, yep. maybe it's just the kids I have now, but like they overplay rather mm -hmm. than... Just like Basie, what, what, what's the story? He would just sit there and not play, talk to the people yeah, next to him, whatever. He would literally, he would... he'd get up and wander around, have a taste, and so like shake somebody's hand, walk back to the piano, plink, go over and say something to somebody else. He'd like leave the piano. Right. Yeah. So that's an interesting story. Very sparse. Um, okay, let's start talking about the horn section. Um, articulation. It's one of those things that you once you you can listen to it and think, there's something wrong, but I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. And it's always articulation. Yep. So da 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 is do va do da do da da it's like just you get kids to lighten up on the tongue. Yep. And so you and I both subscribe to that one and to and three and four where you like slur, slur the, slur off the offbeat, offbeat to the onbeat. Beat. Um but just lightening up on the tongue. And uh, I found uh, sometimes I have to explain it like slur it but don't. Legato but you know, just a breath accent. I mean mm -hmm. sometimes there's there are ways to explain it to kids and sometimes kids look at you like hey, the dog cocks its head and like I, I know you're speaking to me but I just I'm yep. not understanding it um, but if you just if you just keep at it you can eventually affect a change mm -hmm. but uh, almost everyone's band that moves to that next level you get a good drummer bass players playing good time and the band plays da 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 it's a voo da you know, well, there's an infinite difference in that. Right. And you just have to keep harping on it. And I think part of the problem is most directors, they're not grounded in the in the jazz language. So they, they don't recognize it. I mean, how many articulations are there in jazz? You have do, which doesn't happen as much. Right. If it happens on the first eighth note. You have the the, ac the uh, accent. Dot. You have dit. Yeah. I mean, that's that covers most of it. Yeah. And then you're running eighth notes. You slur the offbeat to the onbeat. Yeah. yeah. You always tongue the note before a rest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like the hanging eighth note right. thing. Yes. And so course. many times, but a lot of publishers don't write that stuff. They'll slur so, the entire thing and so, then... And, so how about this? So this is like the sideways accent, which is like a form of marcato, as opposed to the TP. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a bunch of, of the people I write for, they'll say you have to do all your articulations over again. I'm like, why? That voo, voo, dot. And they'll have this is dot. Sideways. This yeah. is dot. That's da. It's to, I, like I learned that in the service. That's an open-ended one. This is a closed syllable. It's a dot with a T at the end. And uh, I've had, finally, it, just, it, it dawned on me I'm, as I'm arguing my cause, I'm going to lose this. This is their place. <laughs> yes, I'll change all the articulation. So, but when I teach it to my kids, this is da, da, you know. But most importantly, go through the whole score. And if you don't know what it's supposed to be, if it's not there, write it in in the first part. Mm -hmm. So And take the time to say, kids, get out your pencils. Yep. Write it in this way. And you do it enough over the years, yeah. and the kid, it becomes the culture. But you're right, the amount of bands that, if the rhythm section's good, after that, it's articulation. Yep. Add dynamics and, like, right. you yeah, got so a band. This, mo most anyone can subscribe to, I can make it in tune. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? And mm -hmm. I, can, I can fix the rhythms. Mm -hmm. So, I mean... Rhythms, but that's kind of like the building block stuff. I mean, getting to that next level of like trying to get the band as happening as it can be. I mean, we're, I think we're going to all say, okay, write notes, check. Write rhythms, check. In tune, check. Okay, but where do you go from there? Mm -hmm. And that's the things that we were just talking about. Um, I So I, I don't know when I learned this, but that when the saxophone section plays as a section and the trombone section plays as a section, trumpets plays as a section. But then you have this, I heard Ellington started this where it's like, Barry starts playing with trombone four and then alto one starts playing with trumpet one and trombone one, right? Like the, we call it vertical, vertical alignment. Yeah, alignment. Yeah. yeah. Um, so how can you tell, so how do you teach it differently? If it's like alto one pairing up with trumpet one, how do you teach that differently versus, you I, know, I alto think, one? And, I think I know what you're asking and as a writer and I know you've done some writing. Um, oftentimes, um, it's like, Control C, Control V. Like if you do a voicing for the saxes, oftentimes that voicing is the exact same thing as the trombones. Um, or if you do like a line, 
um, the lead trumpet line is the alto line. So yeah. a lot of times you can get that vertical alignment. I do it for pitch more mm -hmm. than anything. Okay, like trumpet two, you're with alto two. It, it's set like alto two on a high A is sharp mm -hmm. like a mile. So I usually use that sort of alignment system. I figure out where the doubles are mm -hmm. in the writing. And uh, I feel you can really clean up pitch issues like that. And I feel like it's you don't have the trumpets don't need to know that as much because they can't hear in front of them as well as the saxophones can hear behind. Yep. Right. So it's more like alto. Why find myself alto one? All right, you're leading here. Play yeah. out and, versus and get more, into the sound. More to that point, um, the tenors who are doubled with trombone two and three or mm -hmm. four, um, you know, back there. It, the, fourth position is negotiable and they're like kind of all over the map trying to find it but the tenor player in front is like i can hear it and i'll just you know find you mm -hmm. you know so or oftentimes you tell the trombone player listen to you know the girl in front of you she's got the, the you you match that okay great so yeah it's and stylistically this is like an oberholzer thing you'll have like the all the lead players tune mm -hmm. like right down the middle um and we subscribe to the same things like all the sense of style and articulation you're going to get from the lead trumpet player. Mm -hmm. it, that's if it's in a full ensemble and then whoever else is, you know, if it's a sax section, obviously you're going to get from alto one, mm -hmm. but yeah. So as long as you t we're back to bass drums and your first trumpet player, if your first trumpet player understands foo -va -doo -da, mm -hmm. it, you know, nice light articulation and tongue, the off beats and the last note after a rest, um, you can, you can make that work. So uh, this is sort of to that point. I, I like unison exercises, um, where everyone, even the third trombone player, has to play the line. Mm -hmm. And just don't make the line crazy, but everyone plays some sort of swinging line that requires some sort of jazz articulation. You know, that, mm -hmm. that's like the same thing in a trombones in a marching band chart. They play 17 whole notes in a row and then do that. You know, as opposed mm -hmm. to like everyone else has got something to do. So right. I think introducing rhythmic concepts and, you know, demand. And speaking on trombone, if they're doing that, if they have those running eighth notes, how do you teach? Because they can't slur right. the offbeat. So well, what do you have them do? Uh, just legato. You know, it's just... Ta-da, ta-da, ta-da. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's just... This is sort of like the same thing with bass. Like a dun, 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 dun. I have to teach bass players, make all of your notes as long as you possibly can before you give up the string. ba do 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 Right? Mm -hmm. So trombones will like really hammer... Or they won't do it. They'll go... Duh, duh, duh. They don't bother <laughs> re-articulating. They just like, you know, fall... Mm -hmm you know, glissando into whatever next thing is coming. Um, and again, that's sort of like teaching the back articulation thing. It's like sometimes the kids don't even know they're doing it. Yeah. So just legato. And I think that's a lot of, uh, that's a misconception. I think people don't understand that they don't slur. It's like a, a faux s slurring technique that's exclusive only to trombones. Yeah. But if you listen to them, you know they're doing it wrong. Yeah. Yeah, right. it's, again, you can tell there's something funny with that band, and I'm not sure what it is. And when you hear them, you're, okay, great, we're gonna fix it. And that. if you hear your kids, and you're like, they don't sound like they're recording in any way. Yep. And if you don't know what it is, ask a local band director. Yeah, no doubt. Or, or email Craig Skeffington, <laughs> or find him on Facebook. <laughs> um, okay, so you make changes to charts a lot. Yeah, you like I do. Cut and paste, and add this, and take that out. And yep. Let's talk about form. Right. Say you wanted to make a chart shorter. Yep. Say a chart is just too long and you want to make it shorter mm -hmm. for somebody who doesn't know how to do that. I generally have not done it to make it shorter. I generally have done it um, to dance around a problem. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to say this before I, I get into that. Um, the idea of like, when do you change a chart and it, can you change a chart? Mm -hmm. So my understanding is like if, if you do something that doesn't in any way, shape, or form, change the arranger's intent. Mm -hmm. Like if the, the turnaround was D minor seven, G seven flat nine, and you thought, no, I really like E flat minor seven going in, and like, and you just revoice the whole, that's not what the arranger wrote. Right. Um, but if I remember doing a couple of Camif charts, there was this interaction between the drummer and the stop time with the band that just wasn't going well. And we had done several rehearsals on it, and we were getting close to crunch time. And so I studied for form. I figured, okay, there's the A section. 45 is the B section. Okay, I'm going to cut from 45 to 65. So basically, you just study the form. Mm -hmm. The typical form is A, A, B, A, or A, B, A. Or a blues. Or a blues, yeah. yeah. So whatever the form of the piece happens to be. And uh, I've also done, uh, and again, on some of Mike's charts, I didn't care for the ending. 
So rather than play the ending, oftentimes, I mean, what's a tune? An intro and an outro. Outro yeah. is, you know, sometimes it parks on a fermata, sometimes it's da da and it's over. So we've actually gone back to the intro on several tunes mm -hmm. and used the intro as the, the way to get out of a tune. Mm -hmm. I've even done that with like festival tunes with my top band. You know, hey, yep. I, that intro is way hipper than the ending. We're going to use the, in, in fact, that's how we got out of Yellow Brick Road. Yep. So anyway. Um, you can also revoice if it's just too high, especially in the brass. Well, that's you that's know, the classic can, one right there. And the, so the other thing, too, is everyone like falls in love with the trumpet part. Well, think about this. If the t um, let's say it's a shout chorus and the first time through is soft and then the second time it's like, there you go. Um, do you even have to have the trumpets in the first time? Right. You know, that was like the typical Sousa thing on the, um, the trio. Mm -hmm. They just have the trumpets sit out. So they and, can rest. Right. So and some some writers are better than that than others. Like I love Bob Mincer's charts, I and mean, his charts are super interesting. He writes terrible things to that he just tortures trumpet players. Mm -hmm. John Fedchuk, genius. Trumpet players are just you know I I couldn't do it. So I always look at how can I make my brass players sound better on the last note of the piece, and if I stretch it out, you know. So cutting stuff out, don't play here. Um, Revoicing some Trump, things. Trumpet one doesn't play here because it's in unison yep. in the section. Yep, no doubt. Um, and then other things like um, this always drove me crazy. There are eight saxophones in the front row. There are two trombones and three trumpets. Well, couldn't one of those extra altos be the fourth trumpet? Couldn't one of those four tenors be an extra trombone? Well, you can do that. Of course you can do that. You just need to put in the work. Yeah, just have to sit in front of the computer and just do it. Yep. So anyway, it drove me crazy. Every time I judge a festival, I'm like, why didn't you just take the time to, you could have fixed that. It would have sounded great. We went to, a, uh, well, you remember, it was the year, I don't know if you were at Westbrook then. I think it was still George, 2003, 2004. Yeah, I was still in, I wasn't there. Okay. Um, my second band, this is, uh, is going to sound like an exaggeration, but it still stands with me. Um, we had 13 saxophones. We didn't have any trombones, and I, we probably had six or seven trumpets. So all, I, I had a bassoon playing trombone four. I had some tenors playing, the, and then I think a flugelhorn I robbed to play yeah. trombone one. So somebody said to me after that, one of the judges, I, if you didn't know, you wouldn't know. I mean, it was, you know, and I love that. I was yeah. like, I solved the problem and the kids and the kids didn't know, nor did they care. And they performed better and you got your band got credit for they, it. They absolutely did. So um, I, I'm thought of a, a Jeff Priest um, trick, right? On the, sh on the shell chorus or whatever, when, if you want to make the parts easier for brass section, um, he, he and Cheyenne, I think at, I know where you're middle going school, go ahead and say many it. times we'll take the lead trumpet part and just put it in octaves in trumpets and trombones. Can I ask you something? Yeah. Where do you think he got that? You. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Beautiful. So if you do that, then all the brass have octaves and then the saxophones who have no problem with harmony because they're keyed instruments, right. then you, st and nobody would even know. Nope. Yeah. But the, but the brass sounds very mighty. Yep. You have octaves, as you know, that's like marching band 101. You know, how do you make a band of 20 sound like 40? Put everything in unison, mm -hmm. you know, then, then it, okay. Because sometimes the pitch can get squirrely if, you know, but still, yeah, that's, there are so many little things that you can do. I just, a lot of times, I like to think that they're not necessarily lazy, but just uninformed. Like people just don't know that that's a, that's a possibility. You, well, you because fix this. Yeah, I mean, you, you buy a concert band chart and you just play the chart, you know, you don't. You don't change it as much. Yeah, as but it, but even then, from like Terry did a, a great uh, Highland Lake Overture, whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, I love the piece. But it was um, it was written probably at the three and a half level, and you know, as you know, sometimes okay, oboe's not doubled, maybe horns not doubled, and I I had a band that needed as much doubling as possible that year, so he was very kind and he sent me the finale score, and uh, I ended up writing, you know, all sorts of like extra parts, and. Uh, so anyway, that's the same sensibility. If there's stuff that's missing in the concert band piece, write it out. Figure out a way to, you know, who's, who's sitting around for five measures that you can use right. to fill that voice. So actually, well, I enjoy that challenge. If it's like solving the puzzle, yep. you know. That's and if you're a director and you don't know how to do that, but you know there's something wrong, mm -hmm. if you have a gut feeling, it's right. Follow the gut. Yep. Right. Find somebody who Find can someone. help you. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you don't know anybody, find, find Greg's <laughs> Kevin Kinn on Facebook. I'm not sure about that. but um, Okay, I want to talk a little bit about your music. So whatever comes off top of your head, um, 
your 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 best couple charts? The, uh, the the cliche answer is like if somebody say, what's your favorite chart? Is it the one I'm working on right now? Um, I think I counted because I have them just uh, on the, the wall in my office. I have like a color of, of each each one. I think I have 23 that are published, which may not sound like a lot, but I mean, That's a I lot. remember when I got my first one, I was like over the moon. Um, I wrote one that I, I know you know, Molly March. Yes. From my youngest daughter. It's super uh, cool. Thank you. Um, it got played at Midwest, and uh, that one's probably probably my favorite, just because it's the harmonies. Like I remember sitting down, and I I don't consider myself a piano player by any stretch of the imagination, but I heard this chord, and I'm like, where could this go? And I went, you know, tried to go with the circle. I went chromatically, and I think I went like a tritone away. I'm like, oh, that was interesting. Where could that go? And then it was like I just s- fell into like this progression, and I was like, quick, I got to write that down for I figure, you know, forget it. Um, so that's that was the thing that got played in Midwest, um, Trofeo de Bolos, mm-hmm. which is funny because I've heard it so many times now. I'm kind of kind of sick of it, but yeah. but yet it's still cool to hear. And uh, that one, you know, for better or worse, sells. You know, some it's an awesome thing if you write something that you really like that then other people really like, and it, you, there's some monetary value with that. So what else sells really well? Emergency stopping only was something I wrote. Um, I did an arrangement on when I fall in love, which is sold well. Naima mm-hmm. was a chart that sold well. This last one I did for Kendor, Wombat Combat, which is <laughs> <laughs> I have to credit Laura Patrickwin with that. Um, yeah, so there's this. Stan Buchanan taught me early, uh, uh, "Lady, your cow is on fire." Um, <laughs> that was the name of a, a, a jazz ensemble chart. He said, "Craig, I only pick them by good." Na- titles you know if the title's interesting so anyway i try to come up with interesting titles so while we're there i had it i wanted to talk about like funny naming of chart stories so that was you stepped into it so oh so which other ones have my my favorite one i think is because molly got molly march and then you asked your other daughter hannah so then she she could title a chart and she called it my friend the couch uh, you're close it's it's backwards so when hannah was a baby i wrote the hannah shuffle okay and uh, it was this loud rowdy like whatever and uh, i have to redo that one so that it could get published the molly thing i did and that got taken that was awesome molly came down when i was working on a samba and i didn't have a title for it and uh <laughs> so molly said can't you just call it my friend the couch and i'm like Okay, I could, and I, say, I wasn't going to fight it because I didn't have anything better. And the funny, so that got published. But that's sort of like the game of uh, what's the phone tag where I tell you something, Telephone. yeah, and it goes up the right row and comes back, and yeah. it's like completely different. Yeah. So it was supposed to be like that quick, and when they recorded it, went. So everybody plays it too slow now. I was mortified. I was like, "Oh my god!" It's because it says half note equals whatever. So anyway, it was. It's the hippest chart that I've written that no one plays that got published because the the recording is just so ate up. So and then there's the burger that ate my wallet. The burger that ate my wallet. We were at <laughs> we were in New York and we went to uh, TGI Fridays. I thought were you was that the era that you were going to? There I was, was I was there. Okay, yeah. Crystal was there. I think it was an I edge trip, and uh, I left my wallet because I, I wasn't going to need it. I put two twenties in my pocket and I said we're just going to go down for a burger and fries and we're going to go hear whatever band. And I got a burger fry and a, a one drink, and it was like forty five dollars, whatever it was. I'm like, you have to be kidding! And so, I and that burger ate my wallet. And somebody said, you should write a chart named that. And I was like, that's kind of how that was born. But it was like a real live, you know. Did you mention reverse of the curse already? I did not. That one, I was trying to think if that got. I think that got played at Midwest. Um, that was when the the Sox won the series for the yep. first time in two thousand four. Um, so I thought, you know, and only people that are Red Sox, you know, fans really, you know, truly appreciate that. Um, yeah. And there's that. And Terry is like this now, too. You know, we both have a body of work now that hasn't been published. I just yep. did a chart on a, a sting tune. Ivan Lin's um, She Walks This Earth. Yep. I have a bunch of uh, Saida's song flute, um, Coltrane, that I thought were surefire. Like this is going to get published and you spend all this time on it and it takes two seconds for a publisher to read it and go, yeah, I, I, we're not interested. So, I mean, I've got 15, 20 other charts that are publishable that just haven't been, you know, grabbed. And if people want to buy them? Um, the ones that I'm, like the originals for mm-hmm. sure, if people contact me, you know, 
that's a, one of the things we were talking about before the podcast is What's, um, yeah. the stuff on Pepper where they have the uh, my score, which is the ability for writers to advertise their own, you know, mm -hmm. um, uncopyrighted, you know, previously owned material. So I have a whole library of stuff like that that I would love to eventually when things slow down market. Anything new that's being published coming out that you're excited about? I, well, that one that I, I told you. Um, so Kendor got sold. I don't know if you knew that. Mm -mm. Excelsior um, bought Kendor. And they're also taking over because Kendor had Doug Beach. So those ex Chelsea, Kendor and Doug Beach are now under the same roof. Peter Blair, mm -hmm. another writer who writes really well for educational. Yeah. Um, Peter, I had sent charts to Peter as ex, uh, ex Chelsea's um, publications guy. So he got back to me this summer and said, okay, the ones you sent, I want this one. It's a, it's a shuffle um, that Old Town commissioned years ago when David Sosia retired. And so Sosia was a huge mentor of mine. So mm -hmm. it was cool to write a, a piece for David. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's that, that's the one. And funny that you say that. My head is spinning. I'm like, I, that's like, I got to get that one done. That's like, I, I still have um, those charts at that level. You're supposed to write solos. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like one of those things. Written when, out solos. The, yeah. When the, the kids in front of you, yeah, I don't want you to read that. Go improvise your own. But they want you to write it, you know, just so you've got that safety right. blanket, you know, in front of them. What about requests? Are there common tunes or things that people ask you to write no i mean i th like i spend more time like last year um sanford um played and the, they were doing a piece that i had done in combo so i said the band director unsolicited i said listen i did a bunch of harmonies for this this th they were doing like lead lines yep and uh, i you know free to just take them you know and so when i heard the band at the festival they had used the harmony lines so, so th that kind of stuff is cool i mean i've got yeah, a, a million things, and I'm sure it's like you've been teaching forever. You know, I've got, I have sections of like charts I've started. Um, yeah. I have this kick and samba that I've started that's about a minute and a half um, that I I just haven't had time to sit down and like make it go somewhere. Um, I have a chart on. Um, that's a, so that, that when you get old, you have to sing the whole tune before you remember <laughs> the title. And this is funny because I've invested like two minutes in this chart. It's like this happening. Um, there is no greater love, and, yes. uh, but it's a funk, and then it, it swings on the bridge, and I was it's totally grade three, and what I can tell right now it's it, it's an absolute home run if I could just find the time to to finish it, you know. Yeah. So I have several things that are like, and it's like the AD, ADHD in all of us. It's like oh squirrel pie bikes oh the Red Sox <laughs> are on. So I will. You have probably have no idea what my favorite chart of yours is. Ah. Uh, it's not published. It's from This Notes For You album, Terry White, Big Band. I think um, it's the second track. That's, have I told you? Nope. I'm old fashioned. Oh, okay. Maybe that's not the second track, but. Uh, it, yeah, I remember it. Actually, and that was, so we didn't, we played that with Terry's band and uh, that I, we did it with Seacoast. And then for 10, 12 years, it went away. It was just like, you know, we'd done that. Yeah. We pulled it back out. I think Chris did it with um, Max and Ryan as the trumpet player, so mm -hmm. maybe three years ago, and he brought it back in. I'm like, I, some, the sign that you're getting old is like you forget that you did something. I'm like, oh, yeah, and I, I, I couldn't even remember. Um, but thank you for I love that. that That's, it's a beautiful tune. You know, yeah. any uh, Jerome Kern tune is going to, you have to work to do a bad chart on it. I, I also wish there were more Clark Terry charts. Yeah. You know, he has yeah. so many great original tunes, but there's just not many. Yeah. There's some, but even the ones that are there are hard. Yeah. Well, Steve Guerra yeah. um, has got a, a couple of just absolutely burning, but that's the, but again, the problem. If you're a high school band director. If they're absolutely burning, you're not going to be able to play them at the high school level. Um, no, that's a great point. That's a, There's so a great album. If people haven't heard a lot of Clark Terry called Having Fun. Mm -hmm. There's like lots of great original tunes on that one. Yeah. That's a great idea. That might, um, Sheba. Mm -hmm. That's a, a great ballad. TP Time. A, yeah. Uh, we did TP Time uh, with the combo. And I did like a, a combo arrangement. It's uh, in that the Real be, Easy Book Volume Two. Yep. Yes. Uh, yeah. In fact, that, I mean, there's a in terms of you know, if you were to say, hey, what are some great resources? Yep. You know, shameless plug for Sheer, and I, I I don't get paid by them for it. But that that combo stuff that they have, the the Easy series, the Intermediate, the series, Real Easy Book, the, and the the Latin. Yep. Do you have that one? Volume One, Two, and Three. Yeah. Yeah. That they're killing. And the Volume One now comes with the parts. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The so multiple parts. I've. Uh, yeah, I, it, when I first started as a teacher, I'm so sure it was the same for you. And it, and imagine if we're both experienced teachers in that genre, 
someone comes out of college and say, great, you got a, a combo. Well, I don't know what to do with a combo. Right. I mean, get yourself the share series for sure. I have another plug. Essential Elements, I think. It's a red cover jazz series. Yep. I bought it from Perkins Music. 100 bucks. And there's like 13 charts in there. Mm -hmm. You get the score and all the books. Yeah. And there's this, the chart plus the demo Eunice and stuff and solo yep. stuff for everybody to play in. So and the, the spinoff of that is the uh, is it first place for jazz. Mm -hmm. um, Dean Sorensen, Chose, friend of mine. Um, that stuff is, he's got lots of articulation exercises, tons of grade one um, figures, both swing and rock. Yep. Um, it's a, It may not be the be all end all, but it's a great way to start to codify things because yep. so much of jazz is like, yeah, you do it like this, but it's not actually written down anywhere. But, you know, people have actually taken to actually writing it down somewhere now. Beautiful. Well, as we wrap up, any messages to band directors that you might have as an experienced teacher? Wow. Well, we were speaking before the podcast that we're both closer to the end than the beginning. But sometimes it's it's nice to find a reason um, to want to continue. You know, it's just like summer vacation is like the... Okay, cleared my head. I'm I'm ready. I can to go do this back. again. Yeah, I can do it again. And uh, yeah, I th I think part of the part of the struggle is that you know you just have to keep your your head down and just keep doing it. And it's difficult, like saying the same thing over and over and over again. But when it comes right down to it, that's that's the message. Mm -hmm. You know, and eventually, if you do it enough times in a different way, just figure out a way to break through. They'll eventually get it. You know? So I know I mentioned it a couple times, but if people want to reach out to you with questions and stuff, how, how would they best get a hold of you? Probably the easiest thing to do, um, you can look me up on the South Portland High School. My, uh, my email address is there. Um, you could also look me up on Facebook. Yep. Those, pro those are probably the two simplest public domain sort of access points that you can, you can find. And I'm, I'm really good about if I get an email, I check it all the time. Yep. And uh, I try to get back to people as soon as I can. So. Sweet. Yeah. Hey, this has been great. You know, I'm, for the record, I'm proud of you. I, think I told you this in an email. Um, these are fascinating. You know, and I think you're Maybe with the exception of this one. Well, <laughs> 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 well and I, again, I didn't bring much to the table, yeah. so I'm sorry. But the stuff you did with TL, um, I know you did one with Dean. Yep. You had several with... Um, your colleague Jeff. Yep. Um, so I think it's it's about time. I think there's so many so many good things in Maine that happen on a number of different levels. ACDA. Mm -hmm. I mean, not just band director, just like you know, collegiality all over. I and mean, we mm -hmm. know tons of choral directors and orchestra directors. I mean, so it's nice that we're putting you know a different pro spin on it out there. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Share, share with your friends. Oh, absolutely. And that goes. I for only I only have two, so you're one of them. So. <laughs> All right, everybody, take it easy. Good to see you, Skeff. We sincerely appreciate you taking your valuable time and listening to the Growing Band Director podcast. Your students are very lucky to have a band director like you. If you have any suggestions for episode topics or think you have an area of expertise to share on a show with us, please reach out. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your band director friends to subscribe as well. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our YouTube channel, and wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for listening to The Growing Band Director. See you next week.